structural elements without almost the content. That is, imagine this, the, the structures of recitative, aria, duets, trios, choruses, but without an actual story. So an opera without a story, an opera without words, an opera without the, um, uh, how should I say, she did this and he did that, you know, the specifics. But we would maintain dramatic intensity of, of, of rise and fall of tension, the release of tension, the structural points, the energy, the emotions. But what we're, we were beginning to investigate was layers of reality, layers of perception of reality. What would happen if right now we would go beyond just the physical existence of, of hands, flesh, piano, um, hair, um, the camera that's taking this video right now. And what if we were to perceive not the, the, this manifestation of the vibration, but we were to perceive molecules, which it is. That exists simultaneously, you know, molecules. Or we, if we were to go further and we were to perceive the subatomic um, existence of it and to see leptons and quarks, or not even see, that word doesn't even uh, exist anymore. But this perception of a subatomic world, which is simultaneous with this. Or what if we were to perceive a galactic, um, have a galactic perception simultaneously and to see this perception of our consciousness in its relationship to this the myriads of levels of, of reality, really, what would happen? So the work evolved in such a way that each act is a shift in reality. It's a reality shift. It's not going anywhere. It's not pursuing anything. It's not a journey. It's not um, a progress. It's not a progression. It is simply the simultaneity of realities. I, I might liken it to cubism in, in Picasso's work. Um, um, she does not have three eyes, <laughs> and she does not have two noses. It is multiple perceptions simultaneously. Then, So I'm, I'm using various um, symbolic ways of creating that, I would say, in that the, the first movement is entirely on the keys, and in, in some ways is very conventional or traditional. And to me, that really embraces this reality the reality uh, of you maybe watching this right now and you see a person wearing a shirt, you know, um, Indonesian batik and speaking to you, right? This is something that you perceive. But perhaps simultaneously, this is pure energy. It's simply vibration. Then. And the distance and the difference between me and you may be nothing at all. You know, this is just a perceived difference then. And even in time, because presumably you're watching this at a later time than when this is recorded. But maybe there is no distinction because actually as you're watching this now, that is in the now time. But as I'm saying this now, this is the now time also. So how are two different now times actually different? Maybe they're not, maybe they are actually are the same. Then so this whole subject of time and perception, dimension, space and time. So in, in the second act, I leave the keys and I'm completely inside the piano. And uh, I, I am exploring the overtones. I'm exploring various aspects of the inside, which represents another layer of reality. And then we peel away the onion, the way Ibsen does in, in, in his Peer Gent. Um, the onion is peeled. And of course, what happens when you get to the core? It's nothing, then, which I would liken to the Chinese concept of Kong, that, that concept of emptiness, right? Um, so in the third act, we peel even that layer, the, the layer of the second act away, and what is there? It's pure energy in that sense. And so that's where the use of the Igbo actually comes in as a metaphysical representative of this perception of a spiritual, a completely spiritual reality. Whereas act two is a bit in between. Is that our energies were um, interchangeable. That at times I would be a protagonist in a recitative. Now recitative is where the 
action actually takes place. Think of this is where action is happening uh, in a story. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a music and a dance of action, which means there may be changes and surprises. So in that, I may be the protagonist, and Maxine may be the orchestra, but the orchestra as in reflecting the subconscious of the protagonist. Because I, I, I believe, and for me, my, my favorite operas, and certainly in writing operas, the, the orchestra is not simply an accompaniment. I think that's rather dull. The, the orchestra is a subconscious um, reflection of deeper realities. And of course, Wagner achieves that admirably. So does Mozart. And um, it's based on that, that, that premise. You know. So other times, I may be the orchestra, and she's the protagonist. And, and an aria is the emotional fruition of that action. So that action has a um, consequence, if you wish. Like the consequence of a mango tree is a mango. <laughs> then, um, the consequence of a hibiscus plant is a hibiscus, then, if you want to put it like that. So the aria is like a mango. It's like a, a hibiscus. It's a fruit of a process. Then. So in that sense, um, we share arias, but we also have duets. And a duet is where two, it could be two lovers or two friends, um, who are exploring an emotional relationship. And, and so all that is very much in place. It, it, it's in the DNA of, of the piece. 